All right, so we're going to read Chapter 5, Section 1 of Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. And it is illustrated so nicely by Lind Ward and published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And as we saw in our last um, section, Johnny went to trial uh, for the accusation against him that Mr. Light, uh, he had accused him of stealing the cup. But Johnny knew that he hadn't stolen the cup. He'd had it his whole life, and it was given to him by his mother. So how is he going to overcome this difficulty? And he says, well, I showed Scylla in July before Mr. Light uh, said that the cup was stolen, which he claimed that that was stolen in August. So the trick then was to get Scylla to the courthouse so that she could testify on behalf of Johnny and say, yes, he did show me his cup in July. Therefore, we know it wasn't stolen. So that was where we left everything. And also the Sons of Liberty start to become important here because Rab is a member of the Sons of Liberty. And so was the jailer and the, the key, someone or turnkey. And, um, and so now uh, Johnny is starting to learn a little bit more about politics. So chapter five, the Boston Observer. They went to the Afric Queen and ate in the dining room. This time, no one asked to see the color of Mr. Quincy's money, like when Johnny went to the Afric Queen before, and they said, you know, can I see the color of your money? Like, prove it. Do you actually have money? The party even grew a little noisy. Isana, Johnny, and Mr. Quincy himself were the most hilarious. Many of the leading Whigs dined daily at the Queen and one man after another stopped at their table to laugh over Merchant Light's public discomfiture that morning in court. Hadn't Quincy practically caught the old fox thieving a silver cup from an apprentice? Mr. Quincy, flushed and happy, agreed to all this, but more seriously, he warned Johnny to watch out for himself. Mr. Light was very proud. That pride had been hurt. From now on, he was Johnny's enemy. But all enjoyed themselves, although Isana drank herself sick and silly on syllabubs. <laughs> and that, I'm, I'm imagining that, that we could look it up later, but uh, syllabubs being like, like a soda or a fancy drink. Johnny was disappointed when Rab told exactly how he had got Scylla to court that day. It was not half so exciting a story as Johnny had expected. Rab had simply shown Mrs. Lapham a letter signed by Governor Hutchinson and stamped with the great seal of the colony. It had been sent to Mr. Lorne, commanding him and the other printers of Boston to quit their seditious, rebellious publications or else. Well, Mrs. Lapham could not read. <laughs> All Rab had done was to take Scylla by the arm, unfurl the letter at Mrs. Lapham, point to the seal and say, Governor's orders. <laughs> he had not given her time to call the well-educated Mr. Tweedy out of the shop. Rab and Scylla ran hell for leather to the courthouse. That means really fast. They just ran the whole way. He had already schooled Isana and hidden her nearby in case he was unable to produce Scylla. Both girls, he thought, had done marvelously. That's what Miss Light said, the little girl agreed eagerly. At least she said I was wonderful and... Oh, forget it, said Johnny rudely. That Isana was just about getting above herself. During dinner, it seemed to Rab that Johnny planned to go back to the Laphams to sleep and to Scylla that he was moving in with Rab. Okay, so nobody really understands where Johnny's going. But Johnny decided to sponge on neither, not until he had a job, and something a lot better than delivering papers for Uncle Lorne. He had noticed the number of boys who came and went about the Queen's stable. The wind was howling up from the sea, beating the waves against the wharves. It was a fine fall, the days crisp and full of sparkle, but the nights from now on would be too cold in the open although warm enough hidden away in the stable with hay or a horse blanket to cover to cover one 
or to cover one, and the warm animals giving off heat. So he's basically thinking, I can sleep in the stable. He slept in the stable that night, and on the next day did find a sea captain who would, in spite of the bad hand, take him on as a cabin boy. Johnny did not like the captain, the ship, nor the voyage. It was going to Halifax, and the cold turn the weather had taken and his insufficient clothing made him desire a trip to the tropic sugar isles above all else. Uh, I believe Halifax is like Nova Scotia, so it's up off the coast of Canada. Um, so he wants to go to the Caribbean, ah, tropical and warm. But all seemed settled until the shipmaster casually told him he must furnish his own blankets, oil skins, sea boots, warm pea jacket. Johnny had no money to buy such things. Having no safe place now to leave his cup, he had tied the strings of the flannel bag to his belt. It struck at him as he walked. The luckiest thing he had ever done was to disobey his mother and show this cup to Scylla last July. Now he would disobey her again and sell it. There were many silversmiths who would have bought it, but the cup was so old-fashioned he could not expect from them more than its value in old silver. However, Mr. Light, owning the matching cups, would pay a very good price. So, once more, he went to that merchant's counting house on Long Wharf. Oh, dear. <laughs> it was the same as before, except Cousin Sewell was not there. The grasshoppery old clerks were bent over their ledgers. Neither moved as Johnny slipped quietly past them and entered the inner office. Mr. Light looked up from his papers. Now, remember, he has been warned to stay away from Mr. Light because Mr. Light is a proud man. And he's going to have it in for Johnny. So, I mean, that is your foreshadowing for sure. But let's see what happens. Mr. Light looked up from his papers. There was a glimmer almost of hatred in the sliding black eyes as he recognized Johnny. Mr. Justice had humiliated him publicly, and the story had gone quickly around the wharves among his friends. He spoke very quietly. Well, look, I have no money, no food, only the clothes I stand in. I've no choice. This cup is worth about four pounds if I sold it for old silver. I'm a silversmith and I know. But to you, because it matches your others, it is worth about four times as much. Give me 20 pounds and you can have it. Through the melted tallow on his face, there was a faint flush of blood. <laughs> Although his voice was suave enough, Johnny knew he was furious. I've never yet bought stolen goods. I'm not going to begin now, not even with my own. Johnny put the cup back in its bag, but before he could tie the strings to his belt, Mr. Light's long fingers had reached out and taken it. If, you'll, if you will give me back my property, Johnny said politely, I'll take it to Mr. Revere or Mr. Burt. Four pounds is all I really need. Now wait a moment, young man. You know you stole it. Make a clean breast of the matter and I will not be too hard on you. Justice Dana was a fool to be taken in by those lying girls. I didn't steal it. That was settled for all time in court. Once on his feet, Mr. Light moved quickly enough. He was at the door, blocking Johnny's escape. Haddon and Barton, he said, the old clerks came scurrying in, their pens in their hands. Sewell's still down the wharf seeing about the molasses. Very well. We can do what's to be done better without that puppy. Now, Haddon and Barton, here's a boy, that Johnny Tremaine, you've heard tell. Yes, sir. Shut and lock that door. He's not so sunk in poverty and vice, but to have a glimmer of conscience. No, sir. And so two days after Mr. Dana found him innocent of stealing my cup, he comes to me privately, confesses the theft, and wishes to return it to me. Indeed, very noble of him, sir. 
Mr. Haddon and Mr. Barton, you are witnesses of his repentance and voluntary return of my stolen property. Yes, sir. Uh, give me my 20 pounds, Johnny was breathing hard. You thick-witted little wharf rat, go whistle for it. I've two respectable witnesses who will go into court and swear that whatever I say is true. Do you think any court in Boston, even Dana's, would listen to you and your wretched girls if I and my clerks said contrarywise? You daring to suggest you are my kin? <sighs> Johnny saw he was trapped. I'll get that cut back, he said through white lips. You thief. Haddon, look in the street. See if Captain Bull is still about. Fetch him. If anyone is hung for stealing cups, it will not be me. Wharf rat am I, you gallows bird. Threatening my life, is he? Now I'm not going to be... Too hard on you, uh, ha, 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 as long as you had the decency to admit your theft, having a bad time getting work since you burned your hand, eh? Well, my Captain Bull is taking the unicorn to Guadalupe on ebb's tide. Maybe you'd like to settle in Guadalupe. Boston is getting a little crowded. More opportunity in Guadalupe for lying, thieving, scurvy knaves. Haddon came back with Captain Bull. Johnny gave the captain one startled glance. He was an enormously powerful man, with a neck as big as Johnny's waist and huge hands hanging down to his knees. Each hand looked as large as a bunch of bananas. The courtly bow he attempted at his employer only made him seem more the baboon, but this formality gave Johnny one split second. He shot out of the inner office before Captain Bull had recovered from his bow. Haddon flung up his bony arms, trying to stop him, but went down like a bunch of faggots. And faggots are sticks of firewood, so if you imagine, they just crumble. Okay, sticks of firewood, he just he falls down. Johnny kept on running up Long Wharf and the short length of King Street. He dove down Crooked Lane into Dock Square, knocked over a basket of feathers a woman was selling. For a moment, was mixed up in a drove of squealing pigs, but he knew where he was going and shot down Union Street. <sighs> Salt Lane at last, and the little man observing Boston so genially through his spyglass. Then he stopped, looked behind him. The street was empty. No Captain Bull. <laughs> Baboons could not run that fast. Rab was not in the shop, only Uncle Lorne. Do you still want a horse, boy? <sighs> he was breathing so hard he could hardly speak. Uh, why, yes, said startled Mr. Lorne. Sometime, but there's no such a hurry. We've been hiring a boy from the Afric Queen for a month, and <gasps> will I do? <sighs> Mr. Lorne went to the window, opening on the shop's backyard. Rab was out there brewing up a kettle of printer's ink. The web twins were learning how and fetching faggots for him. Remember, firewood. Rab, Rab, his uncle called to him. Here's that Johnny back again. Will he do for a rider? Yes, Rab's voice, cool, haunting, drifted back on a cloud of evil-smelling black smoke from the yard. Very well, Johnny. Of course, you know how to ride. <sighs> I've, I've never been on a horse in, in my life. <laughs> well, well, I'm afraid now, really. I can learn. Rab, what? Can that Johnny Tremaine learn to ride a horse? Yes. <sighs> All right, boy. You sit down and catch your breath, and I'll explain. This isn't a full-time job, and I can't do more than sleep you, bait you, and clothe you. But you'll have the first four days of the week to pick up money for yourself, or to go on with your learning, if any. I've got a fine library. If Rab says so, you can sleep in the loft above this shop with him. If he'd rather go on alone, my wife will put you up across the way. 
The Observer is out every Thursday, and the papers are delivered to the Boston subscribers on that day. You can do it faster on horseback, but on foot if you'd rather. That takes most of the day. Then, next day, Friday, you start about 5 in the morning, and you ride through Dorchester, Roxbury, Brookline, Milton, and so on. Rab will draw you a map, leaving a certain number of papers at various inns. The subscribers go fetch them themselves. So, late Friday or early Saturday, you cross the Charles and go through Cambridge, Watertown, Waltham, Lexington, and so on, and last is Charlestown. From there, you cross back into Boston on the ferry Saturday night. Rab came in with a kettle full of the warm, black, syrupy ink. There was not a smooch on his white shirt or leather apron. The webs were black as imps from hell. <laughs> "'Rab,' said his uncle, "'where's Johnny to sleep?' "'Oh, with me, of course.' "'Well, you show him where, "'but first take him over to the Queen's stables "'and show him that horse you bought. "'If ever you made a bad bargain, "'it was when you gave money for that goblin. "'But you take the afternoon off "'and give Johnny a lesson in equitation. "'Show him how to fall off without getting hurt. "'He'll need it if he's going to ride that devil.' "'Johnny's new life had begun.' Be sure and click subscribe. Come back for the next video.